Nobody does vids on stuff that sucks because they don't get paid by the companies to do it. That, my friend, is very true. And in fact, sometimes we even run the risk of getting sued for the crime of saying something a company doesn't like. Still more than happy to do this, though. everybody, welcome to SMG Viewers Comments, my weekly show where I want to answer your comments and questions to the best of my ability. If you've got something you want to know about recording, mixing, being in a band, just general advice about that sort of thing, leave a comment below. If it's a question that'll help out more than a few people, I'll be more than happy to put it on the show. Just a big reminder, we've got the Pro Mix Academy Summer Insanity Sale going on starting today. And that's going to have the Ultimate Rock Mixing Bundle, the Heavy Guitar Bundle, and the Everything Bundle. These sales only come up once a year. And if you never got your hands on Guitar Tone Mastery or the Ultimate Reaper Guide or any of my courses, now is the time to grab them because this sale ain't going to be around for very much longer. I'll have more information on that later on in the show. Anyway, let's get right to it. Instead of learning insane shredding skills, it would be nice if guitars put the time into learning how to write and arrange great songs. Then we would get more new music people actually wanted to listen to, and those guitars would get the fans they want. Ding, ding, ding! We got a fucking winner right here, guys! That's the thing I've been saying for years to bands who come in through the door. It's like, yeah, you guys can really play guitar. Now, where's the fucking song? That's the thing. Where the fuck are the songs? I'd love to know. It's like... Warren Hewitt actually pointed this out to me last summer. I thought this was a good point. The great metal songs, the ones we all fucking remember from the 70s and 80s and even the early 90s, were essentially pop songs at their core. They had memorable choruses. They had hooks. They were heavy as fuck, but they still had that pop sensibility to them. I mean, like, I even remember saying this way back in 2004 when we were tracking the second Woods V Prey record, uh, we were doing the song Shedding the Deadwood. And I said to Dave when they when they laid down the bad tracks, I'm like, am I hearing a bit of a pop song in there? And he, he gave me this glare, but he knew I, I was onto something there because it's like, essentially, that's what that song was. It was black metal, but it still had a certain pop sensibility to it with a very memorable chorus and hooky as hell. Dave wrote great fucking songs. He was a songwriter first, not a shredder. That's why a band like Woods uh, resonated with so many people. I think we need to come back to that quite a bit. I mean, like, granted, the grunting thing is cool, I guess, but it's like it's kind of been done to death. It's like write a memorable chorus, you know, write something that's going to hook into people's minds and make them want to keep coming back for more. The reason why Van Halen was so great was not only the amazing guitar skills of Edward Van Halen, it was also the amazing pop sensibility that they threw into those songs that made them last for so long. We need that. Work on that first. Worry about the guitar fireworks later. Get your priorities straight. Glad I love watching your content, but come on, man. It really took you 10 fucking years to learn how to mic an amp. I call total bullshit on that. Glenn, I am an engineer for the last 25 fucking years and of my career and current state have been working in the space and intelligence side of things. We really do rocket science, nerd stuff, and it doesn't take 10 years, but you, again, took 10 years to learn to mic cabs. Don't take this as myself being a dick, but again, come on. Let me clarify that just ever so slightly. It did take me 10 years. It took me about five minutes to learn how to mic a cabinet. It took me 10 years to figure out how to make it sound great, and that's where we got the eagle as landed. Oddly enough, a little bit of a nod to you rocket scientists out there. Seriously, it took me forever to figure out how to dial in my amp, get the mic just lined up perfectly, and get a sound I could truly be proud of. It took me forever. And if you don't believe me, here are my notes. I mean, like, uh, you know, here's uh, 2007 setups, 2008 setups, 2005, 2006, 2009, 2010. And it's like, I've just, you know, I've got diagrams in here. Here's like, you know, mixed notes for 2006, October 12th. And this is the thing, I'd write down a lot of my of my amp settings and whatnot. You know, here's some here's some more mixed notes. Here's some miking diagrams from 2005 for what song I used, where I put the mic, what the amp settings were, all that kind of stuff. I've just got pages and pages and pages of this stuff. Believe me, it was definitely a lot of trial and error to really get my head around what it needed to be. 
Remember, back then, amp sims and cabinet simulators really didn't exist the way how they do today, so I really didn't have a great frame of reference. I didn't really have a lot of bed tracks to go out and listen and compare my stuff to either. So I was definitely flying blind. I gotta say, a lot of the guys on the Andy Sneap Forum were a huge help because we'd post mixes up and get people to critique them and all that stuff, and that was a wonderful way to do it. I think the system these days has been streamlined quite a bit because you can just pull up an amp sim and it's generally set up to sound great right out of the box and it's like, okay, great, now if I wanna go mic and amp, I've got a great reference point. I didn't have that to go by. I just had to do it on my own and it was an awful lot of work. I don't regret it for a minute though. Are the studio foam wedgies from Oralex worth buying? I'm looking to treat my room, but I'm not sure what to go with. Well, I'm sure the marketing guys at Oralex are probably gonna wanna hang me for this, but honestly, I'm not a huge fan of that particular brand because they don't do bass traps very well. Foam doesn't really do a great trick in, in the lower end, and that's the most important part of the room you need to treat. Uh, I'd check out Ethan Wiener's Real Traps. Uh, those are a great little commercial product you can buy to put across your corners and they'll do a lot more good than the Oralex will. Uh, you can also watch my video on how to make your own. Uh, that one really did a lot of good and I actually have a AB comparison in my drum room where I took them all out and then put them all in while playing drums. You can just hear the bottom end tighten up. You'll probably save a bloody fortune if you just do it yourself. I highly recommend checking out that video. Nobody's lending you 82 grand to build a recording studio. They will lend you 82 grand to go to school and waste your fucking time for sure, though. Both areas of the economy are on autopilot for the last decade. Companies underwriting these student loans are going to start going bust. Schools will shut down, and only then will things change. Of course, you're referencing Monday's video, The Truth About Recording School. I think you've got a good point there. Uh, somebody else in the comments on that video mentioned that the government is actually underwriting a lot of those loans, so we don't have to worry about companies going bust, and more and more students are just going to be put on the debt tit that they're going to have to deal with for their entire lives. Seriously, guys, the whole recording school thing, when you have like a 21% chance of actually landing a job, please proceed with caution on that. I think the thing that goes back to saying nobody's going to lend you 82 grand to open your own recording studio says an awful lot about just how successful opening a home studio these days will be. If you want to work on your own stuff, if you want to grow your own skills and maybe record a couple local bands, that's one thing. But if you're expecting to open up a full-time commercial recording studio, you got another thing coming, as Rob Halford would say. All right, guys, it is time once again for that amazing Pro Mix Academy Summer Insanity Sale. Got some really cool stuff this year on the Ultimate Rock Mixing Bundle. There are 30 courses in there, including a bunch of my stuff, like Total Heavy Guitar. There's also Scott Elliott's Guitar Tone Mastery and Mixing Extreme Metal, plus Adam Steele's Ultimate Reaper Guide. Now, there are 30 courses in this bundle and the sale is only going to last to July 9th, so I'd highly recommend grabbing it while you can. Adam's course alone is probably worth that price of admission. It's the best thing I've ever seen on Reaper. It's absolutely incredible. I know a bunch of you guys grabbed it last year. Now's your chance to get it with a whole bunch of other courses that are equally as amazing. My personal favorite being Scott Elliott's Guitar Tone Mastery. That is just worth its weight in gold, especially if you're into recording metal guitar. This sale only comes around once a year. I'd highly recommend checking out those links in the description below and grabbing it while you can. Now back to the show. Glenn's views on Pro Tools are simply wrong and arguably misleading. He has so many praises for Reaper, and yet not a single reputable producer or studio uses it. It has nothing to do with length like, of time the program has been released, and it has everything to do with the results! Pro Tools, Ableton, FL, Studio Logic, and Cubase are all finically when you really set them up and you find the minor issues and fix them. There is nothing as done in his plug and play Pro Tools as a paid first coast a couple days to set up an avenue of issues in years! I mean, Glenn has so much to say about how everyone should listen to him and follow his advice, yet hasn't produced or recorded anyone notable in the last 20 years. Also, saying you're booked for solid for a year when all you do is record with the local unsigned bands for Windsor Essex, who have all gone on to do nothing, is laughable. Well, the first thing I'd like to address in that is STOP CUPPING THE MIC, dumbass! Seriously. Oh, I'm fucking cool. I love the last bit. You know, we've heard the same argument oh so many times. Oh, he hasn't done any one of any. No, yes, that's right. Okay, I'm just in the same situation as so many of you guys out there. I'm working in the trenches, working with the local bands, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I've just been doing it a little longer, and I'm trying to save your dumbass some fucking money! But that's the wonderful thing about ad hominem. We can take that exact same logic and apply it to you. 
Who have you recorded? And by your own logic, maybe we shouldn't listen to you either. The point about nobody reputable using Reaper is quite simple. Pro Tools was established many years before, and that is what the industry works with. So that does seem to be still an industry thing, although it's not quite as relevant as it used to be. For most of you guys out there, you're not going to be doing big label projects because let's face it here, the whole big label budget recording bands thing is kind of a closed shop and they're very happy with who they're already working with. There's absolutely no reason for you guys to drop thousands on Pro Tools when you can get Reaper for 60 bucks and get the same functionality with much more customizability. And here's the thing, I like Reaper because it fucking works. I'm at a point in my career I can work with anything. I've done some stuff on Harrison Mixbus, I've got Cubase, I've got Studio One, and those are all very nice programs. I'm just very comfortable with Reaper because I can get shit done quickly with it. But coming back to the whole Pro Tools thing, I've got to ask, since you're a Pro Tools user, how's that working out for you? You getting a lot of big label projects? Glenn, I've been watching your channel for a long time. One thing that brings me back is your honesty. If it's good, it's good. If it's crap, it's crap. Straightforward, no bullshit. It's commendable on your part to have a goal. Educate yourself, support yourself, and when you have a measure of success, share that with people around the world. I appreciate the fact that other people have different opinions and respect their right to express them. However, it would be much more constructive for them to follow your lead. Then they can have positive discussions instead of pissing and moaning because they are butthurt about something they have very little or no knowledge about. Keep up the great content and keep pissing off the haters. Well, that's the thing about being a working class guy from a small town. It's just, you know, when you work six days a week for eight hours a day on swing shift, you just don't have time for bullshit. It's like, fuck that. Give me the fucking truth. Let's stop fucking wasting everyone's time and get to the fucking point. Because I've got to spend eight hours of my day doing something I fucking hate to be able to afford to do something I love. That's been my whole philosophy from day fucking one. Nashville went through this period where everybody had to have monster cable. It was this gigantic, thick fucking cable, and it was a nightmare. A couple of engineers in town got endorsements, so I would have had to rewire the whole fucking studio with it. I got so tired of doing that shit, I would just throw the cable on the ground and make it look like I had rewired it. They would see the monster cable go, oh boy, listen to that sound. Man, monster cable is really kicking hard. And I would just have it in there lying and looking like it was patched in, watching them make idiots of themselves. Engineer Mark Nevers, fed up with being treated badly by spoiled divas, abandoned the country music establishment to start his own studio and has made a name for himself on the other side of Nashville. Wow, there's some fucking harsh truth now, isn't there? Thanks so much for sharing that quote. Um, and uh, major salute to Mr. Mark Nevers. That's pretty fucking amazing, to be honest with you. Yeah, the whole cable thing, I don't fucking know. You know, this is the thing in my entire career. I've never plugged in one cable for another and go, wow, that sounds so infinitely better. Because physics just doesn't fucking work like that. You might be able to measure a very, very slight difference from cable to cable, but I would really recommend saving your money. Here's some CAT6 network cable. Also it turns out this is a very, very amazing four channel analog snake. I did a video on this stuff a few months back by using XLR breakouts and whatnot. You know, I got this for 11 bucks for a 15 foot cable. What is a four channel or eight channel snake gonna cost you at 15 foot going from say DB25 to XLR? That's gonna be a couple hundred bucks. Believe me, this is way more economical and I certainly haven't heard any downgrade in my sound quality, that's for sure. Why? Because this is quad twisted pair. Everything is twisted at different ratios, so the noise rejection on this stuff is outstanding. And just for the record, that is analog audio over network cable, not Dante. I think your tube test was pretty spot on. I can only add to that discussion by saying the bias of a tube amp that has an adjustable bias can color the tone more than a different spec tube. An old customer had a Marshall head where the bias was really cold and it sounded nice when we rebiased it to be more in the middle and it sounded better. Not sure if that was the volume perception or not, but might be a part of this argument. Thanks from the third circle tone of hell and fuck you, Glenn. Oh, dude, thanks for writing in. Yeah. Here's the thing, I never ever said that rebiasing your amp wouldn't make a difference. I've got a 5150 with a bias mod on it for specifically that. Absolutely changing the bias is going to change the sound of your amp. No question about it. I'm not even trying to debate that. How much it changes? Yeah, again, it could be a volume thing. Who the fuck really knows? I guess I should measure that as well and, and just eliminate the variables to see what happens there. Actually, that's a, maybe a good idea for the follow-up video because I do want to do a better test just to double and triple check my results to make sure I'm not off my fucking rocker. But I mean, like a lot of the way a lot of guitar players reacted to that video, you'd think I'd pissed on a nativity scene or something like that. It's like, fuck sakes, guys, tubes aren't to be worshipped. They are merely tools. Fucking get over yourselves. 
Hey, Glenn, do you think mixing in an anechoic chamber would be a good idea? Because you mentioned room treatment very often. I wonder if an anechoic chamber would probably be the most perfect place to mix because there's no reflection of any sound. And if you put yourself in a perfect listening position, you might be able to make accurate decisions on your mix. I don't know if this question has been asked before. It would be a stupid question, but I am curious to know your opinion on this. I don't think you'd get great results because people wouldn't be listening in an anechoic chamber. That's one of the big problems I see with that particular line of thought because if it sounds great there, it might not translate into the real world very well. I am going to do an experiment later this summer though, and that's going to be taking my mix rig outdoors and try mixing outside without any reflections and whatnot, just to see what kind of results I'll get. Look forward to that. I'm going to be testing out some of the new Cali IN5 and IN8 monitors for that. I'm just waiting for some good weather so I can try that out. Having your work devalued is the curse of every creative professional and nobody values the work other than creative professionals like fucking musicians. I'm a senior visual designer for a big tech company now, but in the early days of my design career, all I wanted to do was create artwork for bands as a freelancer and I got to see this firsthand. I had a band steal poster artwork I did for another band and use it as their own. I had another designer steal my artwork for use for another band. I had a band ask me to create a very elaborate CD layout with illustrations and everything for a whopping $50 and smear my name when I refused. I had another band ask me to create an identity package for them and refused to pay me for my labor after it was completed because they broken up in the meantime, which taught me to always sign a contract. Working for musicians and by and large, thankless shit work. So it's not wonder musicians get their heads out of their own asses for long enough to realize their own brilliant art isn't the only work worth a damn. That's a really fantastic observation. Thank you so much for sharing with the class. I don't think I have anything to add to that other than I really like the phrase there, working for musicians is thankless shit work. I couldn't have said it better myself. Bravo, man. Okay, question. I'm a newbie at recording period, but I've been playing multiple instruments for 25 plus years. I love the sound of analog recording albums, as do a lot of us. Would wanting and purposely waiting to save up to record in an analog studio, would you consider promoting analog recording to a type of client baiting? Being a recording newbie, I assume a lot of what I like and hear in analog recordings comes down to compression, but I'm sure there are plenty of nostalgia on my end as well. Really don't want to waste my money over nostalgia, lol. Thanks, Glenn. Well, if you record onto tape, you're definitely going to be wasting your money because it is really fucking expensive. And most of the bands you're going to have come through your door won't be able to play to the proficiency they need to be able to play on tape. I mean, like, okay, maybe Aerosmith can pull it off, but, you know, local gent band, yeah, good fucking luck. Thing is, though, I've got a lot of outboard analog gear here. I got a whole rack full of compressors and EQs here, and I'm going to be doing a shootout video software versus analog. And I've been really getting into a lot of analog processing as of late because I find it just treats the sound a little bit differently than plugins do. I'm not saying plugins are bad, I'm just saying I get a slightly different sound. But a lot of you guys have also been commenting about how good my mixes have been turning out as of late. There's a reason for that. My favorite client bait is the vintage 24 track two tape machines because nothing says productivity like spending three hours cleaning, calibrating, and otherwise setting up a reliable 30 year old Atari MTR 90 with the temper of a 70 year old drunk. There is a reason why these left in the 90s, they were the only things that sucked worse than Pro Tools. I'd gladly trade back some years of my life dealing with these things, but only if I never hear some hipster try to tell me that Ampex 456 sounds better than digital again. Knowing I am closer to death than thus closer to never hearing some idiot spew that drivel again makes it all worth it. Yeah, tape's fun, tape sounds great, tape's a gigantic fucking pain in the ass, and yeah, unless you're a fucking hipster with a lot of money to burn, I really wouldn't recommend it. I remember we had a two-inch Studer uh, back at Sheridan College, and the thing I remember the most about it was broken half the time. Gotta say, Glenn, I love your videos. I'm not really a metal gal, but most of your topics apply to pretty much any genre. I always pick up new tips watching your show. You're spot on about the DI boxes. I have a bunch of radios that I use live and in the studio. Yes, they cost more, but quality gear is an investment that you never, ever regret. Oh, and congrats on the documentary. It's very cool. Hey, thanks, Heather. I really appreciate that. Somebody asked that, I think, last week. You know, what outboard gear should I get for my guitar? I'm like, buy a fucking direct box, you cheap motherfucker. Seriously, it's just a no-brainer. Just go. Get one. Stop making excuses. Go buy one or do what this next guy says. I picked up a DI box from DIY RE for just over a hundred bucks. It took 10 minutes to assemble. Their entry level one is 60 bucks and the top model is 150. No excuse. There you go, guys. You can put together a direct box for 60 bucks. All you need to do is know how to solder. Yeah, right. Like we're ever going to be able to find a guitar player who can do more than just play guitar well. Put a soldering iron in his hands and go, huh, what do we do with this, man? I found myself lately unfollowing a lot of YouTube guitar channels because, quite honestly, I cannot watch one more IR or amp sim video. I'm old and I'll fucking stay a tube amp elitist. Hey, you know what? There's nothing wrong with tube amps. I fucking love tube amps. I've certainly got enough of them in here. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with trying out an amp sim from time to time as well because the technology has definitely come a very long way over the last couple of years. Remember, man, you're never too old to learn new things. 
It's weird that you complain about everyone using all the same IRs and VSTs, but if everyone is using the same outboard analog gear and drum recording techniques, it's fine. Maybe it's not the tools and never was, but the person using the tools and maybe it doesn't matter if it's the same IRs and samples when it's a completely different brain controlling them. And maybe Tyrone's completely full of shit. Have you listened to Modern Metal lately? Wow, talk about fucking cookie cutter. I mean, like, seriously, music these days sounds like it comes off an assembly line. And trust me, as a guy who worked on an assembly line for 27 fucking years, I would fucking know. Great thing about recording analog drums is the sound of the drums is in the hands because it's an acoustic fucking instrument. And the great thing about using analog outboard gear is there are tolerances between capacitors and resistors, which will change the tone ever so slightly. Problem with everybody using the same samples and IRs is they are an exact 100% copy. Hope you learned something, Tyrone. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. Once again, we got that Pro Mix Academy Summer Insanity Sale going on right now. So if you want to get Total Heavy Guitar, the Ultimate Reaper Guide, all my stuff, and just a crap ton more lessons, including Motorhead, I would definitely recommend checking out the Ultimate Rock Mix Bundle, or if you really want to go gangbusters, check out the Everything Bundle as well. Sale is only on until July 9th. Follow the links in the description below. I'm fucking out of here.